Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our parent webinar on helping youth overcome summer reentry anxiety after COVID-19. Uh, my name is Dr. Yasmin Ray, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor and the program coordinator for the Child Anxiety and Phobia Program here at the Center for Children and Families. So for this talk, we're going to discuss ways that parents can identify signs of re-entry anxiety in their children um, and how to help their children handle re-entry anxiety. So the start of the COVID-19 pandemic clearly marked a very big transition in all of our lives. Um, and a transition is a time when things are changing. Like when children, you know, first start to go to school and they need to get used to new classes, uh, new friends, new teachers, going to sleep a little bit earlier. And we know that transitions are temporary, meaning that we all learn to adjust um, and do well after a big change. Transitions or changes are also pretty common as we get older. And we also know that transitions give us opportunities to grow and to learn. And these can be as simple as learning to ride a bike or driving a new car. And most people are going through a transition now um, as things begin to return to normal um, after COVID-19 pandemic. And we refer to this as re-entry. Uh, since many of us are fully re-entering society, as it was prior to the pandemic. So throughout the coronavirus pandemic, all children transitioned to distance learning. Um, we all learned to entertain ourselves and to communicate from online platforms. Um, and we became more accustomed to staying home on weekends. And although this transition was originally very difficult, it also led to incredible growth for some people and for some industries. Uh, for example, many people began attending telehealth appointments uh, for medical and behavioral visits. Um, and this is a new normal that you know, many, of, many practices are offering right now. And many of us also became more tech savvy as we navigated different online platforms and became more aware of safety and hygiene procedures that you know, may prevent um, respiratory illnesses in ourselves and our loved ones. And we are now transitioning to a new normal. Uh, and many children are learning to re-enter the world as usual with little to no restrictions. It's very common for anyone, especially children, to experience higher levels of anxiety during this time of transition. Therefore, re-entry anxiety refers to anxiety that people feel as they re-enter society as it was prior to the pandemic. So our goal for this talk is to recognize this re-entry anxiety and help children manage their anxiety so that they can safely enjoy their summer. So first we're gonna talk about how to recognize anxiety and re-entry anxiety specifically in children. So anxiety is one of the most common problems in children and adolescents, and higher than usual levels of anxiety during big transitions are expected and common. Um, studies do show that between 10 to 20% of all children and adolescents have an anxiety disorder. And these disorders are among the least likely to be noticed and referred for treatment services. Also, people assume that most childhood anxiety problems go away on their own. Um, although anxiety may decrease uh, significantly after a transition, enduring anxiety may lead to poor outcomes without proper management. So what does anxiety look like? So anxiety is made up of three parts. We have our thoughts, we have our feelings, and we have our behaviors. So thoughts tend to be negative, um, exaggerated, out of proportion to reality a lot of worries that something bad might happen. Feelings tend to be physical sensations, bodily reactions like your heart beating fast, um, headaches, stomach aches, sweating. And behaviors, well, usually, you know, the hallmark is avoiding, you know, trying to stay away from situations that children are afraid of. Um, another behavior could be freezing up or crying um, in situations that make children anxious. Uh, another behavior we may see is reassurance seeking from their parents. 
Uh, in other words, they will ask their parents a lot of questions or the same question over and over uh, to ensure that they're okay. So for example, with re-entry anxiety, a child might ask their parent over and over, is it safe to go to this birthday party? Is it safe to go to summer camp? Are you sure? Are you sure? Um, so sometimes the thoughts, you know, might trigger the feelings, uh, which trigger the behaviors, but it may not necessarily follow this order. And additionally, some kids experience one of these parts more than others. So some kids might engage in a lot of anxious thoughts and worry. Other kids might experience a lot of avoidance and other kids might experience a lot of anxiety feelings in their body. Things that lead to anxious thoughts and feelings and behaviors are what we call triggers or cues. And some common triggers during this period of reentry might include things like having to leave the house, you know, or interacting with a group of people uh, for the first time after many, many months. And so a study by the American Psychological Association revealed that half of all adults feel uneasy about adjusting to in-person interactions um, once the pandemic ends. And this was true for people with and without vaccinations. Before, most people were worried about locking down. You know, now a lot of adults and children are worried about returning to a new normal um, that they haven't experienced. So rather than worry about lockdown isolation, many families are worried about overexposure to COVID-19, uh, to increasing face-to-face -face social encounters and returning to in-person tasks that require efforts that we may have taken for granted, like sitting through traffic to get somewhere. And some children are also hesitant to attend summer camp uh, or another outdoor activity, you know, as this might be too much for them to handle at the moment. And the news too also has played a larger role in maintaining or increasing anxiety. You know, although we have effective vaccines and over two thirds of US adults have been vaccinated uh, with minimal side effects, some groups of people are hesitant to vaccinate themselves and their children. And finally, news about vaccine rates um, happen at the same time with conversations about new and riskier COVID-19 variants. So re-entry has provoked anxiety about exposure to COVID and to social uh, interactions. So now going back to the previous slide that showed the three parts of anxiety, let's see how this might apply to a child that is having re-entry anxiety, okay? So here we have a trigger uh, that the child is invited to a small birthday party, okay? So here we have thoughts, um, remember they're negative, they tend to be anxiety, anxious, they're exaggerated, they're out of proportion to reality. So an example, a couple of examples of thoughts that this child might have is if I eat cake, I might get COVID or this is gonna be so awkward, you know, after being away for so long in isolation, some children might feel awkward. Or if I leave the house, I will get sick. So in terms of feelings, you know, if the child is going to go to the birthday party, she might have um, bodily reactions. She might have a heart, a fast beating heart before going to the party or stomach aches or sweating. And then in terms of behaviors, well, you know, maybe the child might try to avoid attending the party. Or if the child goes to the party, might call parents to get picked up early. Or they might cry when they have to do something that makes them feel scared, like if they have to interact with others and remove their mask to eat, or they might seek reassurance from their parents. So um, they might ask their parent over and over, is it safe to go to this birthday party? Are you sure? Are you sure I'm gonna be okay? Over and over again. So when we talk about anxiety, we're referring to anxiety that gets in the way of doing well. Okay, so the purpose of this slide is to show you the relationship between levels of anxiety and well being. So, we all need anxiety at some level, it's adaptive. And so, here we're gonna give examples relevant to social interactions and COVID 19 safety. So, when there's too little anxiety, so over on the left side of the, the slide, we might not care so much about COVID safety or you know, how we interact with other people. Um, with too little anxiety, we may place ourselves in situations that increase the risk of COVID transmission. Um, when there's just the right amount of anxiety, so over in the middle of the slide, 
we develop increased awareness and respect of safety and boundaries. And this leads us to be most prepared and confident in our approach with COVID safety and with face-to-face -face interactions. But when there's too much anxiety over on the right, then it could lead to significant distress, which could reduce well-being. So for example, people who, uh, who use you know, multiple gloves excessively during COVID uh, and then touch their face might actually place themselves at higher risk um, for COVID transmission. Um, also, excessive worries and panic about COVID might lead to excessive avoidance of social situations for kids, which can lead to disruptions in friendships and also maintenance of anxiety. So now let's talk about what we can do if a child has too much anxiety and re-entry anxiety to be specific. So step one, um, there are several things that you can do. So the first step really is to just show your child a lot of empathy and warmth. Okay, so that's the first step. Um, you might wanna normalize what they're feeling, let them know that they're not the only ones that are feeling this way. Um, another thing that you can do is um, that's helpful is to discuss how you cope with situations um, that make you nervous in the past. So for example, you could tell your child that when you used to get nervous, you would take a deep breath and try to come up with thoughts that could help you face your fears. So you wanna discuss coping here in this situation. You don't wanna tell them, for example, oh, I was never nervous about interacting with, with others. That might not be so helpful. And another thing that you can do if your child has too much anxiety is provide them with some education um, about the nature of anxiety, right? So here we go back to our tripartite model, right? Our thoughts, our behaviors, and our feelings. Teach them about this, okay? The three parts of anxiety. You know, tell them, um, talk to them about the triggers, the cues that might trigger this anxiety. Explain to them that when they experience re-entry anxiety, like going to a birthday party or starting camp in person, that they're probably going to have anxious thoughts about COVID or interacting with others, um, you know, that might make them feel more anxious or can get in the way when we want, just want them to have fun in the summer, right? Explain to them that when they're anxious about these things, that their heart might beat a little bit faster, their stomach might hurt a little bit, they might feel hot, choked up. Um, explain to them that another way that they know that they're anxious about reentry is that they might prefer not to leave the house. Uh, they might try to stay away from other people, or if they do leave the house, you know, they might freeze up or they might feel tense uh, during interactions with others. So after talking with your child about the nature of anxiety and the three parts of anxiety, then the next step is to address the problem, right? So the first component that we are going to address or discuss is behaviors. So more specifically avoidance. So once you explain to your child about avoidance, then you can teach them that one of the best ways to be less scared is to actually face your fears instead of avoid. And the more that they face their fears, the less anxious they will become over time, right? So we like to call this riding the wave of anxiety. And at first, when a child has to confront something that they're afraid of, like going to a birthday party or going to summer camp, the fear is high, right? And then the fear goes down eventually over time, a lot like a wave does, right? So it's important to mention that if they leave the situation too early, so if they leave the party too early, if they leave camp too early, then they don't allow themselves the chance to have the fear go down on its own. And then the next day that the child has a social event, for example, then the fear is just gonna be just as intense. Um, and so the child is gonna wanna avoid again, right? So it's important as much as possible that we explain to our children that if they face their fears and they stay in the situation instead of avoiding, that their anxiety is going to get better. And so this slide kind of further explains uh, riding the, the wave. And so it gives you an example of someone practicing riding the wave of anxiety. So oftentimes kids expect that their fear levels are gonna increase dramatically if they stay in a situation that causes them fear, right? And this is shown in the red by the red line, 
right? So they think it's gonna just shoot through the roof, right? So as you can see, after a first attempt of facing their fears, and that's the green line, fear levels do go down. They go up, but they eventually go down, okay? And then with repeated practice, the fear doesn't rise as high. It goes down further than before. And so you see that with the purple, the orange, and the blue lines. So this promotes learning that these situations are not dangerous or as scary as they initially thought. And so if kids always avoid and they don't face their fears, then kids learn that avoiding situations are the only way to reduce fear and anxiety. And so another way to address the problem behaviors to, is to address safety behaviors. Um, and safety behaviors are these like subtle actions that are used to avoid fear situations. So they're used as an attempt to prevent feared outcomes, uh, to feel comfortable in anxiety provoking situations. Um, and safety behaviors, they tend to dampen our ability to really face our fears and to really see anxiety reduction. So the slide gives you a couple of examples of safety behaviors and the fear that's it is intended to prevent. So one example is wearing like multiple gloves in, in, in public. So here we're trying to prevent touching something that's gonna get you sick. Another example is not re removing to your, your mask to eat in public. Um, so that's preventing quote unquote yourself from getting sick. Uh, another example could be staying quiet in a social situation. And so the fear that it's intended to prevent is stopping so the self saying something unlikable, for example, that would be another example of a safety behavior. So why are these safety behaviors not helpful? So using our birthday example that we used before, a child that demonstrates many safety behaviors might show up to a party with excessive protective equipment, um, like using multiple masks, gloves, bottles, multiple bottles of hand sanitizer, um, a face shield, et cetera, right? Safety behaviors like these uh, tend to be exaggerated in nature. They don't actually enhance safety. Um, so safety behaviors can be unhelpful in several ways. One way is that it stops us from facing our fears. So although kids haven't avoided the situation in, in this instance uh, completely, by using safety behaviors, they're not directly testing their fear. Um, so untested fears are going to continue to arise in the future. And then also safety behaviors could be like self-fulfilling prophecies. So safety behaviors can actually cause the outcomes that kids are trying to prevent by using them. So for instance, imagine if a child stays quiet at a social gathering because they're worried about saying something wrong and not being liked by other kids the other kids might actually be less inclined to interact with this child because they've chosen to isolate themselves. And then also if our fears don't come true, then we mistakenly thank our safety behavior. Thank you safety behavior, right? So if kids use safety behaviors and fears don't come true, then they might believe that the safety behavior prevented their fears. So as a result, kids can become very dependent upon safety behaviors and they start to feel even more anxious if they can't be used. And the truth may be that, you know, fears might not have come true even without the safety behavior, uh, but kids never discover this as long as they continue to rely on those behaviors. So for example, if a child always refuses to eat in public to avoid taking off their mask, they may think that this behavior is what prevented them from getting sick. And then safety behaviors also increase our self-focused attention. So safety behaviors often take kids' focus off the task at hand. Um, and instead their awareness becomes overly focused on themselves. Um, so, you know, very focused on their thoughts and very focused on how they're feeling, uh, which could then lead to further anxiety um, and prevent kids from enjoying activities over the summer. 
So another way to address the problem is to reduce unhelpful behaviors that may actually maintain or increase anxiety among kids. First, it's instinctive for parents to want to save the day, right, when their children are worried and scared. Um, and this may lead to excessive levels of accommodation. And so accommodation is where uh, there is a change in parents' behavior to try to prevent or reduce the child's anxiety or distress. So by providing accommodation, we don't allow children to really fully face their fears. Uh, a lot like safety behaviors, you know, this can lead to maintenance of anxiety. So some examples of accommodation might include letting your child skip that birthday party that he or she was invited to, right? Or not enrolling them in summer camp or unenrolling them after you enrolled them in summer camp. Um, allowing children to eat before parties, you know, to avoid taking off their mask. Rather than accommodation, it's important to encourage independence. Um, and that they can face their fears. You know, this is going to foster that notion in children that, yes, I can do this. Okay. So another example of accommodation is, it's going back to the notion of reassurance seeking, is providing a lot of reassurance um, that, you know, things are going to be okay. So again, children, you know, who experience anxiety, they're going to seek reassurance from their parents. So with reentry anxiety, again, the parent, the child will ask mom or dad, is it safe to leave the house? Are you sure? Is everything going to be okay? Are you sure I'm not going to get sick? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? So the more the parent answers the question, you're going to be okay. Yes, it's going to be fine. Yes, yes, it's going to be fine. Fine, 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 right? Um, the more the child is going to ask, okay? So the more you answer, the more they're going to ask. So make a plan with your child that they can ask once or twice uh, for reassurance, after that, they should use their coping strategies, right? That you taught them, right? Uh, to help handle their, their reentry anxiety. So secondly, um, you know, we don't, wanna, um, we don't want children to avoid anxiety provoking situations or use safety behaviors, but it's really important that children gradually begin to face their fears. So asking or forcing children to be in a situation that is too anxiety provoking um, might be too much, you know, for some kids and we, we can break it down into smaller steps. So for example, going to a large birthday party might be too hard of a starting step for kids, some kids, right? So, you know, kids might be more comfortable meeting one friend at first, you know, you start with one friend and then you slowly introduce more friends until they're more comfortable in larger settings, little by little, step by step. When asking kids to face their fears, it's also really important to validate how they're feeling, you know, not making them feel guilty. Um, an example can be, I know this is hard for you, but I know you can do that. Okay. Um, also, another thing that might be unhelpful is, you know, comparing children to others that are not, are not as anxious. So it can make the child feel bad about feeling that way um, and less likely that they're going to talk to their parents, you know, if they're feeling scared. So continuing on here, um, other um, forms of unhelpful behaviors that might maintain anxiety. You know, another thing is constantly like monitoring symptoms and temperatures beyond recommended practices, uh, constantly searching the web uh, for news on, on new symptoms of COVID. Uh, that might lead to increased anxiety and kids may mistake benign bodily reactions for risky symptoms. For example, a child may think that a headache <clears throat> after playing video games might be a sign of COVID-19. <clears throat> Excuse me. Second, um, the overwhelming amount of news that's related to COVID-19 might be unhelpful as the news rarely gives information that is helpful to parents to reduce stress or COVID transmission. Although adults would like to stay informed, try to limit watching news as a family um, as too much information about scary subjects, can be overwhelming for a child and lead to worries that are hard to stop. So another thing that you can do to address the problem is to help children identify, challenge, and change their negative or anxiety provoking thoughts. So for example, a child with re-entry anxiety might have thoughts like, I haven't seen my friend in a year or, I'll get COVID if I take my mask off to eat, or I, you know, 
it's not safe to leave the house. And these thoughts can get in the way of children having fun in social events over the summer. So one way to address anxious thoughts is to use the three C's. Catch it, check it, and change it, okay? So first you gotta catch the thoughts, right? So you help your kids identify when they're having overly negative thoughts. You know, are these thoughts causing them to feel or appear more nervous, worried, or scared? Then you check it. Check your thoughts, right? Help kids look for evidence for or against their thoughts to determine how realistic these thoughts are. And then thirdly, change it. So identify a realistic outcome or a counter thought. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about check it. So after we help kids catch their negative thoughts, then we're gonna help them check their thoughts, right? To see if they're, you know, as scary as they think they, it is. So here's some examples for gathering evidence to check thoughts. Let's say that a child says that they're worried that they're gonna get sick if they take their mask off to eat. Let's gather some evidence, okay, using that example. So the first question, is there substantial evidence for my thought? It is true that removing your mask during a gathering could increase the chance of transmission, but that is not the whole story. Is there evidence contrary to my thought? Less than 10% of all COVID-19 cases occur outdoors. If eating outdoors, removing a mask to eat and then wearing it again after eating is not considered a high risk activity. If meals occur indoors, then well and well ventilated areas and short meal durations can reduce the risk of transmission. Another question, what would a friend think about this situation? We call this perspective taking, okay? So sometimes worries can become so entrenched um, that it's difficult for kids to see things differently. Uh, by considering how trusted friends or loved ones would view this situation, kids can obtain a different perspective. Another question, how likely, not how possible, but how likely is it that this negative thought will happen? So there's always a possibility of becoming infected with COVID-19. However, fixating on what is possible is not always realistic or helpful. So for example, due to social distancing and high vaccine rates, just about 10% of the United States population has become infected with COVID-19. Smaller rates in children and adolescents. So while it is possible to contract COVID-19, the chances are relatively low among children and even lower when engaging in evidence-based safety practices. And uh, here are, the slide shows you some CDC guidelines uh, for safe activities for people with and without vaccine. So notice that for unvaccinated people, attending small gatherings outside um, is considered among the safest activities provided that unvaccinated people wear masks. As crowds get larger and social distancing becomes less possible, then activities are categorized as less safe for unvaccinated people. A lot of families report that vaccines alleviate distress and allow children and parents to be more confident with the reentry transition as it becomes less risky and it requires fewer restrictions to maintain safety. And this slide here shows vaccine rates by age group in the United States. So some more evidence um, to provide as part of checking our thoughts. Uh, children ages 12 to 17 are uh, starting to be vaccinated and studies have shown that vaccines are safe, effective for kids. About one in five kids ages 12 to 15 have been fully vaccinated and about one in three kids 16 to 17 have been fully vaccinated. So after checking your thoughts, uh, we can help kids change their thoughts, right? Into more realistic alternative thoughts. So in our original example, the child had, had three anxious thoughts. I haven't seen my friend in a year. This is going to be awkward. Another thought was I will get you know, COVID if I take my mask off to eat. Another thought was it's not safe to leave the house. 
So after catching, checking, and changing her thoughts, her new thoughts are, well, I've been talking to my friend a lot online. We're going to have so much fun together after a whole year apart. Another thought would be the chances are low that I will get sick if I only take off my mask to eat. Another thought could be, I know how to be safe when I leave the house. So another thing that you can do if your child has too much re-entry anxiety that can be helpful is to have them do deep breathing exercises. And for some kids, we call this belly breathing, okay? So when we're anxious, our breathing speeds up, which can increase our anxiety. So relaxed breathing signals the body that it's okay to relax, right? It's slower, it's deeper than normal breathing. And this is something that kids can do before leaving their house, for example, during social events, for example. So the slide kind of gives you a little run through of how to do belly breathing with your child. So you, you know, find a place where you can sit in a comfortable position, you close your eyes, then you inhale through your nose, you count until five, that's where the belly goes up, right? Then you imagine inflating a balloon in your belly as you're inhaling, and then you exhale through your mouth, counting till five, and that's when the belly comes down. And then you repeat three to five times or more as needed, okay? So that's an example of something that you can do to help reduce anxiety in the body. And then another thing that you can do if your child has too much anxiety is that it's helpful to build on the positive experiences, okay? Build on the positive. It's helpful to provide a lot of positive feedback for your child's successful coping uh, with these anxiety provoking situations. So one example that um, we can do is something called labeled praise. So that means telling your child exactly what they're doing that you like. So an example could be, I'm really impressed that you took a deep breath to calm yourself down when you were feeling nervous about going to camp, okay? It's helpful to praise the specific behavior when you're praising, okay, that you would like to reinforce. So that's what we call labeled praise. It's also helpful to praise effort instead of mastery. So it might not be helpful so much to reinforce going to camp all week, for example, but to reinforce coping skills um, like deep breathing or a lot of effort put at trying to stay at camp, okay? So effort, not mastery. And then sometimes tangible rewards can help. So in cases where a child has a lot of re-entry anxiety, then maybe providing a reward uh, contingent on the child participating in the social event can help increase the chances of the child facing their fears in the future. So for example, you can tell your child, you know, I know you're nervous about catching COVID and that's why you don't wanna go to summer camp. But if you go to summer camp, then I'm gonna make you your favorite dessert after I pick you up today, okay? So that could be an example of a tangible reward. And then um, some additional tips. You can establish a summer routine. Um, kids, you know, especially kids that have anxiety, need structure, establishing a routine would be good. Um, so the start of summer, you know, as we talked about, starts a reentry period for a lot of kids. So having a predictable routine um, can really relieve anxiety. Um, having a routine also can help parents set and clarify expectations for when they want children to face certain fears. And then also in the routine, um, you can make sure that kids get enough hours of sleep each night um, because that also sleep can impact anxiety. Um, another thing that you can do is just talk about the positive stuff about re-entering. Um, so, you know, you're gonna get to see all your friends again. You can talk about, you know, you're gonna have free time to do fun things like going to the beach, um, having time to do vacation activities, 
going to theme parks, parties, and all those fun things, right? And then because sleep is so important, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, like we talked about, uh, the amount of sleep that kids get can impact their anxiety. And so this chart is from the National uh, Sleep Foundation that provides recommendations for the amount of hours that children should sleep, not just be in their bed. Um, so for example, preschool kids, uh, if you see on the slide, they need, you know, the recommended um, time is 10 to 13 hours a night. Um, for school-age kids, it's between 9 and 11 hours. Um, for teenage kids, it's between 8 and 10 hours, so on and so forth, okay? And, and parents, too, you know, need to get sleep, right? So this can also be helpful for parents and other caregivers because uh, good sleep can also alleviate stress. So re-entry anxiety that occurs during a transition might fade away um, over the first few weeks of summer, but sometimes it could persist um, and begin to interfere with daily functioning. So for example, there could be a lot of avoidance, like not leaving the house, uh, missing important family events and, and social opportunities. Parents might have to miss work or need to arrange costly child care because a child may refuse to leave the house. Um, there may be frequent conflict or arguments within the family. So if the anxiety persists and it's frequent and it's intense and it causes a lot of personal distress, then it might be time to seek help. Okay. And so the child anxiety uh, and phobia program here at the Center for Children and Families has been providing state-of-the-art evidence-based assessments and treatments to children and parents of South Florida since 1990. Um, and we provide clinical services on a sliding scale or at no cost if eligible for research studies. And we provide services in both English and Spanish. And if you're interested in seeking services, um, you will see our contact information at the bottom of the slide. Um, you could also reach us um, over the phone, email, and we also have a website. And here also is some uh, more information about our standard services at CAP, as well as information about research studies that we're conducting or are affiliated with. So at CAP, we provide cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for children and adolescents between the ages of six to 17. Through this service, uh, children learn skills to manage anxiety and are gradually exposed to feared objects or situations. Uh, we have a sliding scale fee for services ranging from $10 to $50 for each appointment. We also have a study that tests a new treatment called attention training for children 10 to 14 who experience difficulty with social anxiety. So children with social anxiety often pay attention to negative things when interacting with other people, such as when, like, when a person looks angry. And the goal of attention training is to change children's attention away from scary things to reduce social anxiety. And all participants in the study will be compensated for the time and the treatment is provided free of cost. And then finally, our team is affiliated with the EMU study and the EMU study aims to study the role that sleep plays in processing emotional memories among children ages 10 to 13. And so when we sleep, the brain fortifies memories from the day. And we, we hope that by studying the impact of sleep on emotional memories, that we can learn more about anxiety in the brain. And in the future, we hope that you know, this work helps inform treatments to help improve children's quality of life. Children don't need to have a problem with sleep to participate and all participants will be compensated uh, for their time. And so if you're interested in our services or research studies, please feel free to call any of these phone numbers um, that you see here on the slide. And that just about uh, wraps it up for us. So thank you uh, so much. Uh, for coming to the presentation and listening. 
Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, and I think now is our Q&A time. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at uh, the chat to see if anybody has any questions and I'll go ahead and answer uh, your questions for you. Okay. Right. So just let me know. Okay, so we have a question from Crystal. Thank you, Crystal, for your question. How can we assure neurotypical children without children with special, about children with special needs who won't wear a mask? Okay, so that's an excellent question. Um, some children with special needs are unable to wear a mask. Um, and so we can talk to our neurotypical children and let them know that as long as they keep you know, six feet social distancing, that they should be okay and reduce the risk of, of transmission. Um, so that's one way that you can reassure them um, and, and that should be able to kind of quell their anxiety um, if they see other children not wearing masks. Excellent question, Crystal, thank you. Any other questions? You're welcome. Okay, so there's no other questions. Going once, <laughs> going twice. Okay, I think um, that's it then. Um, so thank you so much again uh, for attending this presentation. Um, I believe that this presentation is being recorded and will be available. Um, I'm not sure where, maybe YouTube. Um, and so if you have any questions, um, you could also email us um, with any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you.